Uh, we are back at the Cambridge Forum. Uh, I am your moderator, Bob Kuttner. And uh, for this last panel of the afternoon, we're going to be hearing from my colleague and friend, Harold Meyerson, who is going to be talking about uh, globalization of markets with particular reference to manufacturing. Uh, Harold is a columnist for the Washington Post. He's editor-at-large of the American Prospect. He has written for a wide range of uh, magazines, including The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New Statesman, The New Republic, The Nation, New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, etc. And um, he is also the author of a book called Who Put the Rainbow in the Wizard of Oz, which is a critical biography of the lyricist E.Y. Yip Harburg. Uh, Harold, welcome. Thank you. And it's, uh, I don't, have I ever been on a, a panel that you uh, were running? Uh, well, if neither years. of us remembers, that's a bad sign. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, well, and, and, and uh, a warning at the outset that of all the speakers you are hearing today, I'm the one who is not an economist. Uh, I don't even play one on television. I am a, I'm a journalist, but I do write about economic issues, uh, and I cannibalize freely from all of the people you've heard from today and from Professor Roderick this evening. Uh, I do do some field research on my own. Uh, I've been uh, uh, in places like Germany looking at the economy, as Rob Scott alluded to, and I will be talking some uh, about that as, uh, as well. And as Bob Kuttner noted, I am distinguished from all the other folks you've heard from today and that I am not named Robert. Uh, President Obama has stated in his uh, State of the Union address that one of his goals is to double the level of exports uh, within five years that the United States produces. Uh, a totally worthy, terrific goal. Uh, it does not address the net uh, trade balance of this country, though, because as we e increase exports, we can also increase imports. Indeed, that is the path the United States has been on uh, for many years, as Rob Scott was describing in his discussion of how our auto parts policy differs uh, from those of other countries. So uh, I think we need to look at, at the, more, the broader picture here. Uh, and I'll begin with this anomaly, and this is one of the things that got me started starting to write about this. In 2009 and 2010, corporate profits in the United States uh, were soaring at a time when the economy was inching along. Uh, at times, its unemployment level stuck in the high nines, eventually drifting down to, uh, to somewhere in the eights. Uh, but you wouldn't know it by looking at the profits of the uh, Standard & Poor's 500, the largest index of publicly held companies uh, in the U.S. Uh, so where were they making their money? How had they become so decoupled, which is the word I use most frequently in describing the relation of American-based corporations, American-based multinationals, to the rest of the United States? How had they become so decoupled from the rest of the American economy? Well, w one way they became so decoupled was that an increasing percentage of their revenues come from abroad. And this is neither at one level uh, a problem uh, and uh, at another level uh, something utterly not, not, not surprising because the growth rates of uh, other economies uh, have greatly exceeded that of, uh, of the United States over the uh, past uh, 15 years, those other economies, in particular being the growing markets in places like China and India where the average purchasing power is obviously vastly lower on a per capita basis than it is in the United States, uh, but where uh, the economy is growing much faster than in the United States. Between 1995 and 2008, uh, the Chinese economy on average grew about 9.5% a year. The, the Indian economy on average about 7% a year. The U.S. economy, as I think uh, Rob said, not Bob, Rob, uh, uh, at, at a rate of about 3% a year. So it makes sense at some level that corporate revenues of our multinational corporations would increasingly be coming from abroad. But how much from abroad and how quickly this change was made 
really is kind of stunning. Basically, in the one decade of 2000 to 2010, it went from a third of the, corpor of the revenues of the Standard & Poor's 500 to half, or more precisely, in 2001, it was 32 percent. By 2008, it was 48 percent. Now, this is only a problem insofar as companies begin to think of themselves uh, as not really connected to the United States, which has a much more serious impact when we talk about their production. But it's all part of a mindset in which the notion of corporate citizenship, when you introduce this to the CEO of one of these companies, a rational response on the part of that CEO might be citizenship of where? Uh, many of these companies describe themselves, describe themselves as global companies, and it's only in the last year and a half or so that there's been so much, the beginnings of so much pushback to this development that you see uh, things like, uh, on the one level, uh, corporate CEOs begin to say, well, we've got to do some insuring here. Jeffrey Immelt, the CEO of General Electric, heading President Obama's panel on such, and uh, a concern uh, growing among a number of business economists who are in the more enlightened half of business economists, uh, including Michael Porter here at the Harvard Business School, that there is a point past which if you lose enough manufacturing, you begin to lose much else. You begin to lose what the American economic elite believes is our calling card to the world, which is our ability to innovate, our ability to do spectacular R&D and uh, create the next generation of products. Rob was talking about uh, the changes in, uh, in DARPA at the, uh, at the Department of Defense, uh, but there's also a, a longer term and in some ways just as disquieting change within uh, corporate behavior, and that is as more and more manufacturing is offshored, R&D follows it, and there are good reasons for this. Uh, Research and the role, the relationship between research and development and between manufacturing is a somewhat reciprocal role. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, you invent a product, you in, do some wrinkles, uh, then there are these industrial engineers in the factory who say, well, you know, we really need to change a process this way, we need to do it that way, go back to the R&D, and uh, uh, eventually they need to be nearer the factory. Uh, this was stated to me by the head of a uh, uh, advanced electric lithium-ion battery company, a company originated by uh, scientists here in Cambridge at MIT. They found some superconductive substance to put on batteries that would work for uh, an electric car. Great. Uh, you, this is clearly one of these green industries uh, that uh, Rob Poland was talking about. Problem is, uh, once these MIT scientists had come up with this substance, there was no one in the United States who actually knew how to turn out these kinds of batteries. Going way back to the time we seeded all microelectronics, uh, micro uh, transistors, and everything else uh, to East Asia, uh, the only people with experience in manufacturing this kind of thing uh, were in Korea and some in China. And so this company, which is headquartered here in Waltham, uh, called A123, uh, set up its initial factories in uh, Korea and China. But this obviously created a, a problem in that their chief scientists, their R&D people, were here in Cambridge, and it is a long commute uh, to China and Korea from here. Then, courtesy of two kinds of industrial policy, one from the state of Michigan under Governor Granholm, and one uh, as part of the uh, Obama's uh, stimulus package, which gave uh, particular tax credits uh, to uh, renewable energy, uh, they were able to open two factories just outside Detroit, uh, which the head of A123, based here in Waltham, said to me, our scientists really like that a lot better. But the fact is, most companies haven't made that leap back. Most companies have not experienced any degree of industrial policy, save for, as Rob Poland pointed out, 
those benefiting from uh, uh, the defense industry uh, uh, complex uh, have not experienced that kind of industrial policy uh, which uh, would impel them to bring manufacturing home and in fact more R&D drifts off uh, to the developed world and this is concern. Uh, some very establishment people clearly to the right of anyone you're hearing from today uh, uh, at the Harvard Business School and elsewhere who are concerned that if you project this trend down the line what you're going to see is the uh, decline of American innovation. It has to be nearer the factories. The factories are going abroad and there's a considerable body of research that says research and development is following it. Uh, anyway, so we have this rising revenues uh, from abroad and we have rising production from abroad and that was one reason why we, I was sitting there looking at this incredible disconnect between soaring corporate profits uh, a year or two after uh, the downturn and a uh, flatline economy here in the U.S. Uh, they were doing just fine, thank you. They didn't need us to recover all that much. Uh, that's a new and disquieting phenomenon. Now there's another reason why uh, they were doing very well, thank you very much, and uh, not only didn't need us, but wanted to put us down a little. And that is there's also a good body of research demonstrating that corporate profit margins, the percent of corporate, corporate revenues going to profits in particular, are up and wages are down. And someone, uh, someone, a guy named Michael Symbolist, who is the uh, chief investment officer of J.P. Morgan Chase, noted in his newsletter, did a little study, and concluded that about 70% in the increase in U.S. corporate and bank profit margins, corporate profit margins, uh, was due to lower wages. And here I, I want to get to uh, uh, a t a something that I, I think is uh, one of the things we need to keep in mind as we talk about all the effects of globalization on really on the American people. That's the, the subject ultimately here today and on, on people all over the world, but the American people in particular. That is that uh, a lot of the problems of the dysfunctionality of the American economy for most Americans uh, would exist independent of globalization and they can, uh, they are chiefly the problems of a growing imbalance in power uh, in the United States uh, between employers and employees, uh, between the corporate rich and the rest of us. Uh, and if you look at uh, but, but, and this imbalance of power is reflected also in the way different no nations approach globalization. And here I want to build on what, uh, what Rob says. But I mean, the key imbalance of power is that in the private sector, uh, unions now represent only 6.9% of all private sector workers in the United States, uh, which is too small uh, a percentage, too low a percentage, uh, to really affect corporate conduct, obviously in non-union firms, which employ 93% of American private sector workers, but it's so low it makes it easier for uh, corporations that have union contracts uh, to get away with things they couldn't have gotten away with uh, when unions were stronger as well. Since we brought up Caterpillar uh, and the move of Caterpillar uh, from uh, closing down the Canada plant uh, and opening a plant in Muncie. I want to I uh, add a little to this story. Uh, in manufacturing uh, over the last couple years, uh, there has been a continuing downscaling of wages and benefits uh, pretty much to the levels of what the foreign transplants pay in the South, which is you know, on the order of 15, 16 dollars an hour. Uh, if you're a senior employee at, uh, but under union contract worker at GM or Ford or Chrysler, you're making about 28 bucks an hour. New hires come in at about 15 bucks an hour and under the terms of their contract they can't go higher than 19 dollars an hour. Uh, so there's a real downscaling there. But Caterpillar and Muncie has taken this further. They are hiring workers to build these very high-tech, very advanced locomotives in this plant in Muncie, Indiana, 
paying between $12 and $14 an hour. That is not significantly more than what you could get at a Walmart. Uh, and you have this downward ratcheting uh, that is a problem uh, that is partly a function of a global labor surplus and partly a function of the absence of full employment, uh, as Rob Poland, uh, I think, very clearly demonstrated, but partly a function as well of the fact that uh, unions have largely lost the capacity to bargain for workers. They only do it, at this point, for 7% of workers, and they have a very weak hand uh, as they approach that. Uh, so there is a uh, downward scaling there, and the power of workers also affects the way in which a, a, a nation approaches globalization. Rob kind of uh, gave me a little introduction to talk about Germany, uh, and so I will. Uh, Germany, uh, th th at this point, the two nations in the world with the largest trade surpluses are China and Germany. It's a raw number, so in China that kind of makes sense. They have five times the number of people we do. You know, anything that's a raw number there should be, should be pretty high. But we have five times the number of people Germany has. It has 82 million people. How come they have uh, this huge trade surplus? They have multinational corporations there that are all over the world. Siemens is all over the world. Daimler and BMW, uh, they're all over the world. Uh, but uh, they have different labor relations. Uh, also, they have this vibrant sector that in many ways is the backbone of the German economy called the Mittelstand, a German word, uh, mid-sized manufacturers, small manufacturers, who nonetheless uh, are exporters of highly specialized products to hither and yon. I was at uh, a couple of plants, uh, Mittelstand, Mittelstand plants in Germany, uh, the last time I was there. Uh, one that employed about 130 workers was makes, making some parts for high-speed rail. Uh, I, my mechanical literacy here is sort of non-existent. They were making axle box housings. I looked at the axle box housings. I saw them. I still don't know quite what an axle box housing is, but I saw it. Uh, and they sell these uh, to the German National Railway and to China. Uh, and if you're wondering uh, how they're able uh, to do this. Uh, it's a process both at the multinationals and at these little companies of continual upskilling and then a whole different set of institutional arrangements. So what are those institutional arrangements? Well, first uh, is, is the different institutional arrangements in the financial sector uh, because a lot goes back to who, where your funding comes from and how that does or does not alter your behavior. In this country, most of, most of our corporations at this point have, don't get bank funding for most, mo most of their uh, investments. They, uh, they rely on the markets. Uh, they, they get money there. Uh, this is true for the biggest German companies. It is absolutely not true uh, for the Mittelstand companies. There are, there are kind of four levels of German banks. Uh, there are the big banks like Deutsche Bank and Commerce Bank. Uh, there are these public-private state banks, which are big banks, uh, some of which got in some trouble because, of, uh, uh, because banks got in trouble uh, in 2008. And then there are the uh, municipal savings banks and co-op banks. Municipal saving banks are not a left-wing plot. They date to the 18th century before there was a left in any, uh, in any recognizable sense. They're only allowed to do business in their particular community uh, they don't play in capital markets. They get most of the, if, if, we, if you're in Germany, you're going to put your paycheck in there. It's kind of, you know, your ATM bank. But they also uh, are a main source of funding for small and middle-sized enterprises in Germany, and they work with the Landesbanks to help find markets for these very specialized manufacturers. And these companies don't have to worry about quarterly reports. Uh, many of them are family-owned. Most of them are still family-owned. It's, it's, it, it, you know, Germany is kind of a combination of pre, uh, pre-modern capitalism and social democracy. And uh, incongruous though that may sound, it seems to work. Uh, the social democratic part of that is, uh, first of all, any company with at least 50 workers has a works council. 
in which management regularly meets uh, with the employees there, and the Works Council designates particular employees to meet with management. They're often union reps, but they're often not union reps, and this goes in companies that are non-union as well. How do you get there? The question was on how to co-determination on this. That's federal law. That's how you get there. It is also federal law that companies with uh, a much larger number of employees uh, have to have uh, what's called, as Rob said, co-determination on uh, their boards of, their management boards, uh, their boards of directors. Uh, it, it's, it's not a 50-50 split. It is a 50-50 split, but the head guy from management, the CEO, gets to cast a tie vote. Uh, but this is, this is something German companies try to avoid, uh, though it, it clearly does happen. What has this meant in terms of uh, the offshoring and globalization policies of, uh, of German companies. As I said, obviously Siemens, Daimler, uh, these companies are all over the world in terms of their manufacturing, uh, uh, manufacturing facilities, but uh, they keep uh, most of the high value added work, the highest skilled work, uh, uh, the, the, the work that brings in, that would bring in the highest pay in any kind of merit system anywhere, that is disproportionately kept within Germany. Some of these companies uh, have agreements with uh, their union. The main union in, in this manufacturing sector is IG Metall. Uh, have agreements to keep uh, a certain number of employees or not to reduce beneath, beneath a certain number. Uh, and this informs the largest uh, German uh, manufacturers who, whose names we all know. Uh, a kind of disquieting development to show you how different things are here. A lot of these companies, of course, have opened auto plants in the American South uh, that are paying uh, relatively low wages. Uh, and the auto workers union here, the UAW, has enlisted the assistance of IG Metall in trying to uh, create a open, more open climate for unionization in these factories. It's still an uphill fight. Uh, but it's, it's one of the few points of maybe leverage, maybe not quite leverage, that the uh, American unions uh, have. Uh, but it's worth noting, since I'm in Boston today, well, I, whereas I'm normally in Washington, that an influential study by the Boston Consulting Group, uh, which was, the, I think, the first place Mitt Romney went to work before he got to Bain, uh, a study from the Boston Consulting Group last year said, well, you know, we, we can have insuring in this company. We can have a revival of manufacturing. If you look at how steeply wages are rising in China, and how wages are not rising here in manufacturing. And if you uh, look at the obvious greater levels of productivity here, uh, the cost differential between China and the US by the later in this decade uh, is, is going to be diminished to the point that it may not be really that much of an advantage to go to China. And now, so I got a rough draft of this proposal, uh, and in it they said, they said, let's use as our model, uh, they picked the, uh, uh, the Pearl River Delta around Shanghai as sort of representative part of China to measure wages and the trajectory of wages. And in the US, they took Mississippi. And so I wrote in the, my post column that I didn't think Mississippi was really the uh, economic level to which most Americans aspired, uh, all things considered. Uh, and this, this got noticed by the Boston Consulting Group, and they changed this in their final draft of the report to South Carolina. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't think the press doesn't have power. See what, see what we can do. Uh, but uh, th this, this reflects uh, this larger development that the Boston Consulting Group was reporting on, which is that America, as European companies look for places for skilled, reliable, cheap labor, America is emerging as a good market for that. How the hell did we ever become that? Uh, the answer to that question relates to all of the questions on politics and economic power uh, we had here today. It relates to certainly the uh, weakening of unions, uh, and it uh, relates to uh, the just vast inequality.
that we've seen uh, here in the U.S. Um, it's worth noting, I was reading on the plane flight up a new book uh, by Rich Kallenberg and a, a collaborator, Moshe, Moshe Marvit, on changing labor law, something this country has tried to do every time since the Roosevelt administration. There's been a big Democratic majority in Congress and a Democrat in the White House. Four times it's failed. Their suggestion is to add the category of workers seeking to join a union to the employment clause of the Civil Rights Act, just like you can't fire a person uh, for his or her race, gender, uh, age, uh, disability, sexual orientation, add to that, uh, uh, workers seeking to join a union. But beyond these global imbalances, I think our domestic imbalances are, if anything, more pronounced. Uh, they account for the incredible levels of economic disparity we are seeing in this country now. And clearly, uh, we need the political fight to be fought on domestic issues like that, as well as rebalancing uh, the trade issues with, with which this country grapples. Harold, superb. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let me pose a couple of questions, and then we'll invite uh, the audience to join in. So uh, uh, every, uh, every country uh, can't be Germany. Every right. country can't have an export surplus. Uh, so uh, one question is, um, w what would the world look like if every country tried to duplicate uh, Germany's virtuosity of manufacturing and uh, uh, Germany's uh, labor market institutions? Uh, would that create a production glut? Would that, what, what would that world look like? And uh, relatedly, um, if wages in the United States in manufacturing are being ratcheted down to the level of the transplants, that's about $30,000 a year. Or less. If it's, 12, uh, if it's 14 bucks an hour, it's $24,000. Yeah. School, a school teacher makes more than that. Yeah. Uh, an RN makes a lot more than that. Uh, a union dishwasher makes more than that. Depends, so, <laughs> right. So uh, what about the people who say that since manufacturing is not going to, because of automation and productivity, um, not going to provide a large number of jobs in any case, uh, why not put our chips on a better paid service economy? What would that world look like in balance of trade terms, in value-added terms, in, in, in wealth of the country terms? Well, okay, first question first on can we all be Germany? No. Uh, Germany overproduces and underconsumes. We uh, overconsume, even relative to our huge level of production. Um, what would have to happen to what Germ how Germany would have to adjust if other countries moved to more of a German model? Germany would have to adjust to consuming more of its own production, and you would have to get back. Uh, if, if all countries are that productive and that equitable, you know, we should have this problem, uh, then uh, you're going to have to boost your internal levels of production because uh, you're not going to be able consumption. Uh, to, yeah, consumption, because you're not going to be able to sell uh, to all the other countries that don't produce uh, as well as you. Uh, but this leads to the second question, which is, uh, is there a limit to uh, what you can uh, ultimately do with manufacturing, and don't you have to concern yourself with uh, uh, increasing skills uh, and incomes and career paths uh, in the service sectors? And of course you do. Uh, I mean, I'm a big drumbeater for reviving manufacturing uh, for some of the reasons that the Harvard Business School said. I mean, if, if you lose manufacturing, you do lose uh, a capacity to innovate. Uh, and also, it's very hard to see how we get our, our trade rebalanced absent uh, a significant increase in manufacturing. But that said, most Americans are not going to be working in manufacturing, and even if manufacturing comes back some, it's not going to come back to the level it was at just at the, you know, a, a few years ago, uh, uh, since we've, we've lost six million jobs. Uh, all six million are certainly not coming back, uh, partly because of productivity increases, uh, partly because of globalization. Uh, so the real, I the, the, the real issues uh, concern, I think, creating career paths, uh, creating uh, different 
levels of credentialing and uh, creating income uh, in service sector jobs. And Bob wrote a terrific piece in the American Prospect uh, on the hotel union in New York. Now, we don't think of hotel, uh, uh, you know, the people who make the hotel housekeepers and the people, who, the wait staff, uh, as people embarked on a, a particular uh, career or in a good job. Uh, but it's interesting. Hotel jobs are entirely a function of how unionized the hotel sector is in a given city. Uh, historically, they're best in New York and Vegas. Uh, and uh, these are jobs where there's certain levels of credentialing, there is uh, great health benefits, uh, and the market can support it. In Vegas, uh, which I've written about, there is something called the Las Vegas Culinary Academy uh, set up uh, by the hotel union and uh, funded by the, you know, it's part of the union contract. Casinos give 0.0001% of something or other. Uh, to set up this academy, but it, it, it trains uh, inner city kids on some basic hotel housekeeping skills, and then you can raise your, uh, you know, raise your ability. What you do in the kitchen, you can become a cook. I sat in on a, one day on a 46-week course on how to become a sommelier, uh, taught by the uh, chief sommelier of uh, Caesar's Palace, formerly of Hotel Georges V in Paris. Uh, and so jobs that we may think of as dead-end jobs can, in a different sort of political economic context, be a lot less dead-end and a lot more, you know, rem remunerative and productive than we might think. But that requires a lot of changes. I just want to push on one thing, yeah. and then I will throw it open. So to pick up on something that Bob Poland said, uh, if, if green economy is really important, and we're right at the edge of a tipping point where we don't know how to make enough of this stuff anymore, so that we almost have to buy it from China or Germany or wherever. Um, is it okay if we have a green economy where we're installing a ton of stuff and shifting over to renewable energy, even if somebody else makes it? Or is it crucial that we also make some of it? Well, the ecological answer is sure it's okay. The economic answer is it's clearly better uh, if we make it here. Otherwise, uh, you have continued job loss, I think continued income depression and uh, uh, continued uh, trade imbalances. But, you know, I mean, it, it just, well, you know, they're rebuilding the Oakland Bay Bridge in San Francisco, one of the monuments of, a, of, of, of American uh, World War II era construction. And they're rebuilding it with Chinese steel, uh, partly because of what Rob Scott and you were talking about, about the, uh, you know, we throw this stuff open. Uh, as as a, uh, the, the, the president of the uh, Steelworker Union, Leo Girard, uh, said to me, you know, we knew how to build it the first time. Uh, and uh, we, we managed to compete against ourselves uh, often uh, in, in ways that I think are, are really del deleterious to lots of American workers. Thank you. Ellen. Um, I'm just interested in the numbers, but what is the difference between a very skilled worker's salary and a college professor, let's say. Wait, between workers? Workers and a college professor. Uh, the difference in salary? Yes. Well, here at Cambridge, it's a hell of a difference. Uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, in Germany. Oh, uh, I, the, the, oh, in Germany. I, I actually cannot answer that, but I will tell you that CEOs in Germany uh, make, uh, uh, you know, do not make 300 times what their average workers make. It's, it's, it, at, uh, Rob, what were you saying? No, I was saying huh? Oh, here? Okay, okay. Did you have a number for Germany? No, I don't, no, I, I, I don't either, but it is multiples less. Uh, the wage, uh, and, and, and the, one, the one category of CEOs, this I do know in Germany, who do make a very high multiple of what their workers make uh, are... Uh, the CEOs of sort of the new German service economy, like chain supermarkets. Uh, there you find, which is a non-union sector in Germany, it's new and they haven't figured out how to unionize it yet, uh, but for the uh, standard German manufacturers, whom we all know, it's, uh, it certainly isn't in th three, you know, it's, it's less than, a, well less than 100 times, not 300 or 800. 
My name is Michael Brower. A, a three-part question about trade unions in the U.S. Piece of background, my grandfather, whom I never knew, my father's father was a union organizer uh, at the Homestead strike, caught pneumonia and died when my father was six. Mm -hmm. um, I founded here in Cambridge and Massachusetts the Northeast Labor Management Center dedicated to working with union and management as co-equals, and that was our requirement when we went to work in Ford Motor Company and other plants. My three-part question about unions in the U.S. Uh, I have the strong impression that unions have decayed dramatically, been destroyed in the U.S. I think you and other speakers have given us some numbers of the decline of the percent of the U.S. labor force that is unionized. My question is, would it good be, be a good idea? Would it be healthy for the American economy, the American people? our place in the world if we rebuilt unions or supported the rebuilding of unions and if we were to do that how what should we be asking of our state and especially national legislators and president obama to make it easier for people to organize unions thank you uh, boy it would be good for let me let me give you one statistic that illustrates why we need them uh, Emanuel Size, am I pronouncing that right? Okay, Emanuel Size, an economist at UC Berkeley, uh, just calculated off of tax returns uh, some household income figures for the year 2010. And what he concluded was that 93% of all income growth, uh, all household income growth in the year 2010 went to the wealthiest 1%. Uh, the remaining 7% was divided among the next wealthiest 9%, and the bottom 90% saw no income growth. I mean, we're at the point where, essentially, unions have almost disappeared. And what happens in an economy where unions almost disappear, particularly when you know, you're open to global pressures and uh, a high unemployment rate, is that there's no money going to the bottom 90%. But even during the ostensible recovery between uh, the dot-com bust and the, the 2000 financial panic, uh, all income growth was going uh, to, 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 to the wealthiest Americans, and that's a function of uh, not having uh, uh, Americans getting increases in their, uh, uh, in, in their income, despite you know, rising levels of productivity. Uh, and because, you know, I mean, if you want to take several steps back, because uh, American incomes for average ordinary Americans have been stagnating uh, since the late 1970s or early 1980s, uh, the way to Amer Americans maintain purchasing power was the vast extension of credit and debt. And we saw what that led to in 2008. Uh, that was the way Americans maintained their purchasing power. It was not sustainable. So yes, it would be very good for the country to rebalance it. But then, as I, as I said, there have been four efforts to uh, uh, make it less hazardous for American workers to uh, form unions without uh, being uh, fired, which is ostensibly against the law. It is against the National Labor Relations Act. But the penalties that management uh, must pay if found guilty of this are negligible. It's like 5,000 bucks for a fired worker. You know, that is nothing compared to having a union and actually having to give your folks uh, a raise every now and then. Uh, so, um, uh, but under Harry Truman, when there was a Democratic Congress in 49, there was an attempt to alter the Taft-Hartley law. That went, that couldn't break a filibuster in the Senate. In uh, the height of the Great Society, Lyndon Johnson, 1965, uh, a, a, an attempt to do that uh, again. Uh, the AFL-CIO lobbyist at the time, Ken Young, I interviewed him about 15 years ago, told me, well, Johnson sent up 87 pieces of Great Society legislation of the Hill. Only two didn't pass. One was the attempt to change Taft-Hartley. Under uh, Clinton, uh, there was an attempt to uh, make, uh, change the labor law to make it easier for workers to uh, form unions. Uh, didn't get out of the Senate. Under Obama, uh, the same thing. They, didn't, uh, they, they couldn't break a... The 60 vote. Yeah, yeah. Oh, under Carter, it failed by two votes as well. That's right. Uh, uh, the, 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 most, the latest iterations of labor law reform 
have been to, uh, to go to a Canadian union recognition uh, process. Uh, the rate of unionization has not fallen in Canada. And in Canada, if a majority of workers sign affiliation cards, that is determinative and you don't have to hold an election. If there's an election, unions bring, you know, essentially threaten workers with uh, all kinds of job loss and plant closing and whatnot, and uh, these things normally lose. Uh, that failed. And so as I, as I said, there's a new proposal out there uh, that wouldn't address all of these problems, but that would uh, add the category of workers seeking unionization to the category of workers you cannot uh, uh, fire on this basis in the Civil Rights Act. Uh, this is a new idea that's kicking around. The theory being that Americans are, are more supportive of individual rights uh, than they are of collective rights, and it's a hard case uh, uh, to make for the Canadian method of affiliation, call a card check, as opposed to a secret ballot election. I mean, th th this is going to be very tough. Uh, normal, you know, one, one of the huge changes in America over the last 40 years is the sort of re labor relations that you described in, in, in where you've, you were working uh, have been supplanted by what was the, uh, the, the southern model. I mean, you know, in, in shifting from a nation in which General Motors is the largest employer to a nation in which Walmart is the largest employer, that's also a symbol of uh, a, a different kind of labor management relation. And it's the Walmart model that has been, that has been winning. And uh, so long as it wins, I think we are going to be seeing 93% of income growth going to the wealthiest 1%. I'd like to ask a question about the uh, World Criminal Court at The Hague and the role that it might play. Uh, NAFTA and WTO uh, rep and um, uh, represent a kind of de facto government on a certain level. And uh, the United Nations and the World Criminal Court represent a possibly useful countermanding force um, for example, uh, seeds, genetically modified seeds and uh, pesticides and agricultural chemicals, uh, Monsanto and others. For example, Coca-Cola going into a third world country and drawing out pure water and then discharging their waste products until the public outcry is so great they simply close the factory and move on. Uh, and finally, genocide in, um, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, multinationals in minerals, if not actually supporting uh, genocide, will stand aside for it. Uh, so my question is, since multinationals, in your words, represent a global uh, super government, would approaching the United States from the grassroots to urge the United States to become a, a party to the World Tr Criminal Court at The Hague, would this in fact help to enforce world laws or would it allow corporations to stand out from under it since they already are a supra-government organization? Well, I am not a legal expert on things like the World Court. What I can tell you is there are international protocols on things like labor rights that the International Labor Organization, the ILO, has created. It's created uh, eight uh, basic sets of worker rights. Uh, there are about 150 nations that are signatory to all of these. The United States is signatory to, uh, you know, only a handful of these. Uh, we, we have not ratified a lot of basic things on uh, equal rights and things. I think other than, you know, uh, uh, opposing slave labor, uh, which I think is a position we reached in 1863, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure we've gone uh, beyond that and have signed these other seven uh, ILO uh, protocols. Uh, we're a member, we're one of the founding members of the uh, International Labor Organization. Th there's also, uh, over the last decade, as multinational corporations have arisen, 
unions have tried to set up a multinational architecture of their own. So there are now global union federations um, headquartered in places like Geneva uh, that uh, link together, let's say, the steel workers and auto workers here with the steel workers and auto workers all over uh, the world. Uh, these organizations sometimes try to get, you know, minimum standard agreements from global companies. Uh, they haven't been wildly successful. And then there are some American unions that have built particular alliances with unions abroad and try to, uh, you know, meet jointly with these corporations, the steel workers are actually maybe one of the leaders, maybe the leader uh, among American unions doing this. And they have gotten uh, a health and safety agreement uh, with some uh, global uh, steel manufacturers like ArcelorMittal, which is the world's largest uh, steel maker, uh, that affect, you know, that really has, among other things, let's say, improve the condition of miners in Liberia. So there is, there are certain points of entry, but uh, uh, in, in general, the globalization of the uh, government has not caught up in any way, shape, or form with the globalization of the, of the economy. Uh, well, okay, thank you. Let's do one more. Um, uh, it's been a long afternoon, and my head is full of um, you know, sort of at capacity in terms of some <laughs> very interesting ideas and good good analysis. And it's just added to all the other good analysis and good ideas that I've been accumulating for, for years now. And coming back to something that I think Bob uh, did um, allude to earlier, which is, so what do we do about this politically? And I might be interesting to hear from all of our speakers if they any, any of you would like to get in on this. Um, we seem to have a conundrum which is if you, we have a two-party duopoly, both of which are dominated by corporate uh, influence and power and money, the system, the electoral system itself structured the way it is and allowing for uh, the, 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 the role of mostly corporate and private money. Um, so if you go out, try to go outside the system, there are uh, significant problems. Uh, spoiling your vote, wasting your vote, uh, not being able to uh, build power uh, effectively. If you go inside the Democratic Party, there's, there, it's, a, it's a kind of a trap. It's the burial ground for social movements. It's, it's, you know, many of the things that got brought up today we've seen, whether it's the Employee Free Choice Act, the number one item of labor's agenda, n right. didn't get anywhere uh, from the Obama administration. The other things that have been alluded to today. So. Given this conundrum, given this trap, what do any of you have to say about how we can begin to move forward politically? Um, and does it perhaps mean we need to focus a lot more locally, or is that another kind of a dead end? <laughs> Let me uh, yeah. uh, pitch that to Harold, and then if either of the Roberts uh, yeah. has a comment, I'm, I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, hold on a sec. <laughs> well, if you look at American history, uh, in general, I think progress has come more as a result of movements than of uh, third parties. Uh, and I would recommend, there's a new, new book out by the historian Michael Kazin called American Dreamers uh, that I would recommend to you on, on, on this score. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, the abolitionists built a powerful movement, so powerful that they became uh, not the dominant, but a very powerful force within the early Republican Party. The Democratic Party, for all of its limitations, has had periods where it is open to major influence from the worker upsurge of the 1930s and the civil rights movement of the 1960s, and ultimately the anti-war movement of the 1960s, which is how George McGovern got nominated in, uh, in 1972. Uh, so, I mean, my, 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 my short uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, telegraphic answer uh, is uh, it's pretty much what Bob Poland was saying. I mean, you know, you, you, progress in this country comes from building movements. 
Uh, and uh, I, I am, you know, people ask me, you know, well, what is Occupy going to do? Are they going to come back? Uh, which is a very important question, but I think we, we need to step back and recognize Occupy has already done a tremendous service. They changed the discussion. Uh, Obama wouldn't be making the, the speech he made in Kansas and some of the other things he's saying were it not for Occupy. Uh, I mean, you know, every one of the people you've heard speaking here today has been writing a version of that, you know, uh, for, uh, for years. But, you know, that's nice. Uh, but we, you need a mass movement. Uh, and in whatever way, shape, or form they may take, we need to uh, encourage those and nurture those. Okay, we're about out of time. If you have a very quick question, go ahead. Uh, yes, I wanted to say, I, there's different ways of looking at all this stuff, but I, I think a critical thing for all for this influence we've been talking about is public financing of, of elections, because you get all this money that gets passed in through the back pockets, which obviously buys influence. I mean, I think that would, it wouldn't immediately change things, but then people come up with ideas like you do here, and they could actually get implemented. So, and I'd also say I'm very concerned about you know, we, we, in, part of the reason we still have a high standard of living here, relatively speaking, for the world is because the dollar is the, um, you know, is, is, is the master currency of the world. And there's a big push from other nations um, to end that because we've kind of been abusing that. The government overspends and so on. And I just point out that, you know, that'll make for much considerably lower standard of living if that happens. We've kind of got to get our act together in terms of these payments. I won't talk more about it because I know you said we're out of time. Thank you for letting me ask the questions. Sure. And I'm Robert Peterson, by the way, with a great interest in these matters. I'm an engineer by profession, and, but I, I take a great interest in industrial policy and so on. And, Thank you. All right. Do you have a close or? No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, yet, yet another Robert. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm fine. <laughs> well, uh, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Harold Meyerson and Robert Poland and Robert Scott.